And they said unto me, let us go into the house of the Lord. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you this morning, and we thank you, and we give you glory. We honor you, Father, on this Memorial Day. Lord, we right now pray for all those vets that we still have with us. Lord, those who are going through terrible guilt. Lord, those who are dealing with sorrow from the loss of their comrades. Lord, right now I pray that the peace of God would begin to move upon them. That you would encourage them. That you would touch their hearts. That you would move upon them. Lord, right now we pray for our vets that we have, Lord, within our midst. That you would move, Lord, by your Spirit to encourage them through this day. And Father, we know that the words thank you for your service is not enough. Because, Lord, they laid their lives on the line for each and every one of us. And Lord, as we celebrate this Memorial Day, we also celebrate you. How you laid your life on the line and gave your life that each one of us might live. And Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. This is John 14, 1. Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Let not your heart be terrified. You trust in Jehovah, put your trust also in me. Good morning, everybody. I'm unmuted. I already said it. There's no one. I'll use this one, Lou. All right, everybody sing today. Go ahead and start back there. There's revival and it's spreading like a wildfire in my heart. Sunday morning, hallelujah. And it's lasting all week long. Can you hear it? Can you feel it? It's the rhythm of a gospel song. Once you choose it, you can't lose it. There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. I've got an old church choir in my soul. Got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. Got a heart overflowing. I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. When the valleys that I wander turn to mountains that I can't climb, you are with me. Never leave me There ain't nothing, there ain't nothing Gonna steal my joy I've got an old church choir Singing in my soul I've got a sweet salvation It's beautiful I've got a heart overflowing I've been restored There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy No, there ain't nothing gonna Feel my joy
Clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel beat. It's all you'll ever need, all you'll ever need. Clap your hands and stomp your feet till you find that gospel beat. It's all you'll ever need, all you'll ever need. I've got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. Got an old church choir singing in my soul. I've got a sweet salvation and it's beautiful. I've got a heart overflowing because I've been restored. There ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't. Gonna steal my joy. No, there ain't nothing gonna steal my joy. Father, I can see that you were drawing a line in the sand, and I want to be standing on your side. Line in the sand, and I want to be standing on your side. Hold in your hand, so let your kingdom come, let it live in me. This is my prayer, this is my plea, let the worshipers arise, let the sons and the daughters sing. I'm surrendering my all. I surrender to the King. Let the worshipers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I'm surrendering my all. I surrender to the King. Father, I hear it growing louder, the song of your redeemed. As the saints of every nation are awakening to sing, from our hearts there comes an anthem. Oh, hear the heavens ring, this is our song song to our king let the worshipers arise let the sons and the daughters sing i'm surrendering my all i surrender to the king Let the worshipers arise. Let the sons and the daughters sing. I'm surrendering my all. I surrender to the King. surrender to the King. I surrender all, all I am and all I, am and all I have. Singing a song of praise. An anthem, an anthem of 
anthem of praise mm -hmm. I surrender to you the key got nothing new how could I express all my gratitude I could sing these songs as I often do it's your song must end and you never do so I throw up my hands, praise you again and again, cause all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah, and I know it's not much, but I have nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. I've got one response. I've got just one move with my arms stretched wide. I will worship you. So I throw up my hands, praise you again and again. Because all that I have is a hallelujah, hallelujah. And I know it's not much, but I'm nothing else fit for a king. Except for a heart singing hallelujah, hallelujah. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song, cause you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. So come on, my soul. Oh, don't you get shy on me. Lift up your song. Because you've got a lion inside of those lungs. Get up and praise the Lord. Oh, praise the Lord. We praise you, Lord. Praise the Lord. Thank you. 
up my hands and praise you again and again Cause all that I have is a hallelujah Hallelujah And I know it's not much But I have nothing else fit for a king Except for a heart singing Hallelujah Hallelujah I have tasted all that this world has to offer. The hearing gone that leaves you wanting more, you can't satisfy. Father, forgive me for taking so long to see that you're all I need. With every heart beating my chest, Lord, I surrender all that I have. The days yet to come, the days in the past, I'm giving you all I am. With lifted hands, with lifted When I've done nothing to deserve it You see the best in me beneath the dust Cause that's how you love That's how you love You rush through my veins I'm wrecked and I'm changed And my soul will sing I can go to escape your love heaven or grave there is no place I can go to escape your love with every heart
Amen and amen. Amen? I mean, the Lord's good. I uh, want to continue with some of what I talked about last week, but I should have never started going through some of my books to find duplicates because I found some gems. Uh, and I've, I found some books that I, I'd forgotten I had. Anybody li like that? You just found, and it's become a treasure trope. And as I was beginning to do things and looking at this, I was able to find a book that I had been able to purchase at a Corey Ten Boom rally. Any of you know who Corey Ten Boom is? Although it wasn't by Corey Ten Boom, it was by a renowned Jewish man who I'm going to talk about this morning. And as we look at Memorial Day, I think we need to understand that we need to thank God for those who have been moved by his spirit and gone before us to clear the way for us for the Lord to do a, a mighty work within us. How I many of you know what I'm saying? And I, as I began to look at that, uh, last week we talked about the paranoia of being too occupied with Satan. How many of you know what I'm saying? And, and, and getting over that. But this week I want to talk about the other side of that coin. And I want us to come to a balance. And as I, I began to look at this, I began to see some things that the Lord spoke. And one of the scriptures that I ended with last week was from 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18. Therefore we wanted to come to you, even I, Paul, time and again, but Satan hindered us. That's an amazing statement for Paul. And I go back this morning to an author that I spoke about, and I'm going to speak about three or four different authors today um, because they just hit me uh, very hard. And, and the one that I spoke about last, last week was F.F. F. Bruce. And some of you said, I'm going to look this guy up. How many of you look some of his stuff up? Uh, he's, he's an amazing man. But F.F. F. Bruce said that Satan's main activity is putting obstacles in the path of the people of God to prevent the will of God from being accomplished in and through him. How many uh, think or know that you've had some obstacles recently in your life that are intended to hinder you from the will of God being performed within your life. I was watching some of the pre-Olympic trials this week. And one of them, for lack of a better word, and, and I, it may be called this, I don't know, was like a steeplechase. They were running, they did hurdles, they jumped over water, they did all kinds of stuff. It was all kinds of obstacles. And during this time that they were racing, they would go and one would hit a hurdle. Oh, that's going to slow that person down. That's an obstacle that, that slows them down. And then they would run, jump over these ponds of water. 
and they wouldn't quite make it and they would hit the water, oh, that's going to slow them down. But the funny thing about all these runners is not one of them quit because of the obstacle. They all kept going until the end. I believe that we as people of God need to understand that we need to keep, keep going until the end. If we, as, as I talked about last week, is if we as believers are obsessed by Satan, we're not doing anything. We are paralyzed and he has won. Why? Because we're constantly looking for him we're not looking beyond him. Do you understand what I'm saying there? We need to look beyond. There's an old song that we used to sing in the 70s saying, he looked beyond my faults and saw my needs. See, God looks beyond our faults and sees our needs. We need to look beyond our adversities and see his presence. And as we, as we begin to do that, um, we have a flip side. Believers who totally ignore Satan do not even recognize what he is doing, so they have no idea what is happening. It never occurs to them that the enemy of the soul is having a field day because they're completely oblivious. How many of you... You know people that are completely oblivious. I, I begin to look at some of these things, and I, I begin to see some of these things. And I begin to see in my life those times that I've ran the race and I've kept on going because of the obstacles to finish the race. And then I have seen times in my life where I've kind of sat back and became oblivious to the things of God and ended up in deep trouble. There's nobody else like that here, okay, this morning. Uh, Paul said, it's in, the, in this balance, Paul said that Satan is an immensely powerful force. So powerful that he is able to stop the Apostle Paul, who was like a, an evangelical juggernaut, from doing what he wanted to do. That is a profoundly sincere consideration, and quite frankly, it's terrifying. If, God, if the enemy can hinder Paul... I've got news for you, folks. He can enter you and I. And as I looked at some of these things, and I, I just am, was amazed at some of these things. I uh, told you in the beginning that several years ago, I was able to go see Corey Ten Boom. And, and how, many, how many of you know who Corey Ten Boom is? You know, uh, she was a Jew in a concentration camp that accepted Jesus and, and, and stuff. And it was at a, a Holocaust or a Holocaust uh, conference that I was attending. And there were some other people there who weren't Christians but were, were part of the Holocaust. The man that book that I bought was recommended to me by some Jewish folks. He's not messianic by any means. This man wrote 57 books during his lifetime. And as we were memorialized, how many of you know that we need to memorialize those people who, whether they're in relationship with the Lord or not, give us enough wisdom so that we can find a path to the Lord. Now, I don't know whether this man knew Jesus or not. I can't tell you. But he said some amazing things. His name was Eliza Ellie Weasel. Or Eliza Ellie Vizy. V 
B-I-Z-I. -I. He was born September 30th, 1928, and he died July 2nd, 2016. Ellie was a Romanian-born Jewish-American writer, professor, political activist, Nobel laureate, Holocaust survivor, and Nobel Peace Prize winner. If you go on the internet and look up this man, there are multitudes of quotes that he has quoted over the years which makes me think that he might have had some relationship with Jesus. Can't prove that, yay or nay. But how many of you know that we're living in the day of Laodicea? Lukewarmness. And one of the, as I kind of flipped through some of this book that I was looking through, uh, one of the quotes that he said this, the opposite of love is not hate. Now that got my attention. How many of you? The opposite of love is not hate. It's indifference. Lukewarmness. The opposite of art is not ugliness. It's indifference. And here's where it gets interesting. The opposite of faith is not heresy, it's indifference. And the opposite of life is not death, it's indifference. Indifference. He goes on to talk about indifference. Why? Well, let me tell you a little bit about Ellie Weasel. He was born in Hungary or Romania. Grew up during the war in prison in Auschwitz. And said something major to me. He said, not, not only Jews, but everyone in the world, if they would not have been indifferent to what was going on, some of the Holocaust would have never happened. Can I say something to you? If the church begins to stand up and stand firm, some of its problems will be overcome. We are in a race. It's a marathon. It's not a short race. Along with this book, I... I found a children's books book. And it really hit me because I just looked at it. The name of the children's book is called The Tortoise and the Hare. I mean, you remember the story. We as Christians, we become like hares. We run until we're out of energy. We burn out. So we sit underneath the tree to rest. And the tortoise, he just keeps going at a pace, at a pace. And who won the race? The tortoise. Why? Because he kept on going. He kept his focus. He stood firm to the task that he had ahead of him. Indifference. We need to understand who we serve. And one of the things that, that I got a chance to read in both F.F. Bruce 
and weasel was this thing. We must recognize the Bible teaches that God is the sovereign Lord. He knows that he is omnipotent and that Satan is not all-powerful. He's powerful, but not all-powerful. Listen to me. If we are too busy trying to find how to defeat our next battle, we cannot focus on the task of worship because we're too military-minded. That blew my mind. And I, I wish Pat were able to be here this morning because Pat would be a good illustration of something that happened within his life. In his younger years, he was very military-minded. And some of that still sticks with him today because that was ingrained from him. But in his later years, he's not so much military-minded as spiritually-minded. A spirit of discernment, a spirit of, of, of love. We need to understand that God is omnipotent. He's all-powerful. But Satan is not all-powerful. We give Satan too much credit. A lot of things that we blame on Satan, we cause by ourselves. Well, that doesn't mean that there is not a, a, a devil running around and, and trying to do stuff. Because there's balance, and, and we'll get, get to that here in just a minute. He's knowing, Satan's knowing, but he's not all-knowing. He doesn't know everything. He's very real. He's a very real presence, but he's not omnipresent. Listen to me. Satan picks when to come at you, and he will always come at you in your weakness. He will not come at you in your strength. Why? Because your strength is not yours, it's God's. I'm finding out something. There is an importance to running the race with the Lord and gaining our strength to the Lord to be able to offset the advances of the enemy. Do you, you follow what I'm saying here? And, and as I began to look at this, I began to see some things. See, Peter says that the devil is like a roaring lion, lion seeking who he may devour. Right? I am not afraid of the roaring lion. Why? I know where the roaring lion is. What I am afraid of is that lion that's sitting there and sneaking up and sneaking up. And this is the way the devil will do it. And when, when I get weak or when I lose intent, uh, attention or when I become indifferent, he hits. And I begin to look at this graphic devil like a roaring lion seeking who you but this roaring lion is on a short leash. Put it all together and you produce one of the great mysteries of the Christian faith. How do I keep moving forward in the Lord yet keep defeating Satan when he advances? And I began to look at this, and the Lord, Lord showed me about four things that I want to speak to you about in this area. 
that God in his sovereign purposes allows the enemies of souls and the enemy of his purpose to continue his work, but it's under divine permission. The only thing the enemy can do is what God allows him to do. The only thing that can defeat us is when we allow the enemy to have his way in our life against the sovereignty of the Lord. Do you follow what I'm saying? We got, we got an attitude. See, powerful and permitted, but Satan is real. I mean, you would say that. He'll, you'll tell you, he's real. It's, all, it's at this point that we delve into the great mysteries that we can't resolve. At least I can't. See, we've gotten into teachings today. All you got to do is say, yeah, Satan, get out of here, and he goes. That's not true. It's not true. The one thing that we need to know is we need to know who Jesus is. We need to know who God is. We need to know who the Holy Spirit is. One of the things I said last week, there are many people in this world today that are trying to fight the enemy without the Holy Spirit. Doing it in themselves. In this day and age, we cannot and we will not defeat Satan without having the Holy Spirit active within my life. I become very leery. And I'll tell you something right now and just be totally honest. I have not felt free to say this in years in this place. But the Lord spoke to me to say it. simply this. We have had a people and we have had teaching that says you don't need the Holy Spirit. All you got to do is stand up to Satan. Well, let me tell you, you're no match for Satan. I'm no match for Satan. We need to walk in the Holy Spirit. I'm going to be speaking more and more and more about the Holy Spirit, and what the Holy Spirit can do within your life. Why? Because if we need anything today, we need that. I've had people tell me, oh, I don't need that Holy Spirit stuff. I don't, I don't, think, I can, I, I don't think I can accept that. You know, I have the Holy Spirit. You have a portion of the Holy Spirit when you come to Jesus. You do not have the fullness. And I'm beginning to believe more and more, and, and please don't misunderstand me here. I am in no way oneness in my thinking here. But I believe more and more that we cannot survive without having the Holy Spirit so active within our life to ward off and give us... Uh, a mindset that tells us when the obstacle's coming so that we can defeat the obstacle. He's powerful and permitted. I have a hard time with that. Because most of my teaching has come where the devil's powerful. And he's going around and doing everything that's going on. The devil can't do anything that God doesn't let him do. That blew my mind. And it's changing my thinking. Why is it changing my thinking? Because we have the greatest illustration of that in the book of Job. Where Satan goes to God and he says, have you considered, or God says to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Yeah. 
See, it leads me to remember that we're in a spiritual conflict and that our, our opposition is enormously powerful and that we do not mess around, that we do not goof off. God is not calling us into an attitude of shallowness. He's calling us into an attitude of death. To know him. To know who he is. See, in the spiritual conflict, our weapons, listen to this. Because this is what we've been taught in the church. Our weapons are not simply good organization. If you're organized, you'll have it all together. Let me tell you something. I've seen some organized idiots. And I've seen some disorganized men and women of God. I mean, you know what I'm saying. Our weapons are not meticulous care to detail. Formulas. The church for too long has taught formulas. What's formula for? A baby. I would re rather have meat. You understand what I'm saying? And in the New Testament, he says, boy, I, I love to teach you meat, but, but you're, you, you, you got to get uh, off the milk. You got to break your bottle habit. And this, this blows me, my mind, because as long as I, I spoke these things and, and done these things, the Lord says, there's still some habits that you have that are bottle feeding. They're shallow. And you need to break off that and begin to eat something that is good and healthy and nutritious. Now I'm going to get right to the point. Uh, because I want to say this one and I, I haven't put it in. The Lord has recently dealt with me about eating right. Eating right. And I'm doing a better job of eating right. And the Lord said to me, if you are careful to eat right in the physical, you will eat right in the spiritual. Do you understand what I'm saying? You'll get that mindset. But if you're eating wrong in the physical, there might be an attitude where you need to replace some of these things and get healthy so that you can get healthy in the spiritual. Remember what I said? Everything that we have for good has a counterfeit for evil. And I began to look at this. It's not, it's not good organization. It's not meticulous care to detail. But the weapons of our warfare are spiritual. That's what the Lord says. They're spiritual. If we do, if we do not bear that in mind, it's quite possible that Satan will be free to hinder us in our work. We need to understand that we have an everyday fight with the enemy. And the enemy is bound to destroy us. I am bothered, really bothered, by what the Lord has given me in my prayer life. And what we're going to see in the coming months and years. And it's already beginning to be exposed. And it's simply this. That those people who we thought were so spiritual. 
were fakes. Were fakes. And it's going to turn a lot of people off to the things of God. I feel sorry for those people when they have to answer to the Lord. I want to be real. I want to be real. In the last few months, I've caught myself saying things, and even I said it this morning, and it bothered me because the Lord's dealing with me in this. You know, you know what? Three words that will kill you. You know what they are? I don't care. I care. But we get an attitude of ego in the flesh as we talked about last week and we walk into that and we don't care because after all I'm a man of God or I'm a woman of God and you got to understand that because I'm a man of God or I'm a woman of God I have authority over the enemy boy when you get to that point you're in deep trouble the enemy has some people absolutely bamboozled they think that they're serving God they think that they're worshiping the Lord and what they're actually worshiping is their self and if you can't handle that maybe you're part of it because I'm going to tell you something I get to that point every once in a while where the Lord has to take me down a peg or two and I hope you don't, because it doesn't feel good. Uh, when I was a kid, there was a willow bush in our backyard. I was extremely afraid of that willow bush. Not because of the bush. I was afraid because when I did wrong, my dad would take out this knife and when he pulled it out of his pocket and he opened it up the knife was about that long it would would not be legal today it was that big and he would hand it to me and he said go cut yourself a switch off that willow bush you understand the reason why I was afraid of the willow bush it's different today you can't even talk to a kid without them ah! We have lost discipline. Listen to me, church. The church in general has lost the discipline of seeking the Lord, honoring the Lord, seeking the Holy Spirit, and listening to what he has to say to us. I believe that's the reason why in Revelation he says, He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the church. In our spiritual experiences, we can run into all kinds of roadblocks that become exceedingly difficult for us. If we're not careful, our faith will flounder. How many of you have ever had a roadblock that caused your faith to flounder? wonder why because it's natural it's natural and sometimes we're, we, we flounder in those things and sometimes the roadblocks might be there because of Satan's activity I will agree with you with that because let me tell you Satan sometimes goes wild on us how I many you know what I'm saying I've heard some people say and, and I've heard it from more than one person I was sitting in a room and all of a sudden the chair that was in that room or another room went flying across the room and there was nobody there. Or I was sitting praying in my my living room and it was comfortable when I began to pray and I was sitting praying and all of a sudden I felt this cold 
freezing. Like I was frozen. Because the enemy was coming against my prayer. Pray anyway. Sometimes it's because of Satan's activity. But it's also possible, listen to this. It's also possible another thing. That the Spirit of God is trying to tell us something. How many of you know about the prophet? Eli. What do you want? I don't want nothing. Go back to bed. Second time. Here's a voice. What do you want? I don't want anything. Go back to bed. The third time. Here's a voice. Runs into Eli. What do you want? And then all of a sudden he got it. Eli got it. He says, you go back to bed. And when the Lord speaks, you tell him, here am I. I hear you. Listening to the Holy Spirit is important. Listening to what God has to say to us is important. Standing up against some things that are not right is important. I've had two different situations in this church in the past month where I've stood up against something that was wrong. And I found out one thing. People don't like to be told no. People don't like to be told they're wrong. So what do they do? The first thing they do is lash out at you. The second thing they do is say that you got a demon because you said no to them. How many, how many of you had kids? How many of your kids ever told you no? How many of you said, I'll show you who's boss? And discipline came. I don't know about it in your family, but when I told my mom and dad no, and my, or especially my, my stepdad, if I told him no, I'll show you. And it usually came with some type of discipline. Listen to me. When we say no to God, I don't care if you say no to me. It doesn't bother me one bit. Do what you're going to do. But when we say no to God, we've got problems. When we say, Holy Spirit, I'll only go so far, we got problems. And that's when it's not the devil anymore, but it's ourselves and our ego that is trying to destroy our very spiritual life. And that's when sometimes the Holy Spirit has to come and say, I need to speak to you. I need to tell you. And as I began to look at some of these things, as I took some time off and, and began to get into to all these things, The Lord spoke to me and said, we need to be smart to figure out which is which. Discernment. Discernment. We need to learn how to discern between what is right, what is wrong, what is good, and what is evil. Discernment. Imperative that we don't, it's not that we're not shallow in the faith. Learn discernment. Be discerning people. Allow the Holy Spirit to speak to you so that you can discern what he's doing in your life. 
and, and, and what, he, what he's encouraging you to do, to stand firm. It's imperative that we stand firm, that we be strengthened, and that we are band, banded together, encouraging one another to stand firm. How many of you know we had some storms this week? How many of you have seen some of the damage? Spoke to a pastor this week from the west side of the state who's dealing with the tornado damage. A complete city leveled over in the western part of the state. And that church is going in to try to help with some of the problems that they're having. Some of the things that they're experiencing. It's like a third world country. I thank God for Foursquare Disaster Relief who's going not only into the missionary and the other parts of the world, but I thank God for Foursquare Disaster Relief relief when we have disasters in this country and in this state that they come and help out here to also. And it hit me about standing firm and banding together. Sometimes we need to stand firm and pray for one another. How many of you know what I'm saying? Here's the part that we don't like. How many of you need to know or, or know that you need to stand firm and pray for those who despitefully use you. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Lord, I don't know whether to look at them or kill them. I want to pray for them. I had somebody say this to me. I'm praying the devil out of them. You can't pray the devil out of anybody. Except yourself. Do you hear what I'm saying? We got people going around looking for the latest, the greatest, the, the newest, the, the fattiest, whatever it is it might be. And God is saying, look to me. Look to the oldest. Look to the one who is eternal. Rather than your new fad. I, I thought about society today. And I kind of got mad. Kind of got mad. What are they thinking and then I realized I had become my mom and my dad because the things that we did when we were young they were saying what are they thinking I mean you know what I'm saying I walked down the street I seen a purple hair I seen a pink hair I seen a blue hair I seen a green hair and I seen a bozo hair which means it had all different colors and stripes down the kid's hair. And I looked at it, I said, what in the world are they thinking? And the Lord stopped me instantly and said, it's not what they're thinking, it's what you're thinking. Now pray for them in an attitude that I can touch their hearts. God doesn't care what kind of hair you got. In the Pentecostal church several years ago, the women were known by the holiness by the higher their hair bun. And I'm, I'm not kidding you. And they would have it shake. And I remember when I was a kid dodging bobby pins. Because they would shake that thing and it would be up there and bobby pins flying all over the place. But that was a sign of holiness. It's not what's on the outside. 
It's what's on the inside. For years and years, and I'll, I'll just give you one, another one of mine. For years and years, I thought, why would anybody want a tattoo? Because you see kids today and they're full of tattoos. And the Lord spoke to me, and, and some of you have tattoos. And the Lord spoke to me and said, What's it of your concern? See, I'm not looking on the outward. I'm looking on the heart. See, another thing to notice about Satan's activity is, is tempting. He tempts us by our preconditioned attitudes. I know some of you feel this way, and I'm going to say it. You ready? And, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to expose myself this morning in this. And if you don't like it, I'm sorry. For you, not for me. Young man just got saved, and he was an avid smoker. And he went out in the church, out of the church to the front, and he lit up a cigarette. And dear old saint went back there and he looked and he says, I don't know why that guy's smoking because by him smoking, he's going to smoke Jesus right out of his heart. It's an outward thing. Let God take care of it. Or drinking. I'm going to tell you something. I'll be honest with you. I've never shared this with you before. I have a prescription that I'm supposed to drink wine. I had an argument with my doctor when he gave, told me that go get some wine. And he, I said, the people in my church won't understand. I got real spiritual on him. They won't understand that I'm drinking wine all on our, uh, So the doctor, and I said to him, Doc, I'm not going to do it without a prescription. So he got kind of ticked at me. I could tell the way he whirled around in his chair. He pulled out his prescription and wrote me a prescription for wine and threw it at me. And then I developed a study on wine. Take a little wine for thy stomach's sake. I'd condemn for years the Catholic Church for using real wine during their, their time. And then I found out that at the communion experience, listen to me, at the communion experience, Jesus did not use grape juice. When Jesus at the marriage of Cana turned the water into wine, he did not turn it into grape juice. not what it's on the outside. It's not what you think that matters. It's what God thinks. And God's not looking at the outside. He's looking at our heart. I know I'm opening myself up to some of you for criticism because I told you that I drink a little wine every once in a while. Well, too bad. And you guys that drank, I have no, I used to have a big problem with it. I don't. Because the Lord said, don't do nothing into excess, but in all things, in moderation. Just make sure you're not tipping through the place drunk. Then I have a problem. See, Satan puts very tempting opportunities in front of us, which is, if we go through with them, will deliver us into a spiritual shipwreck. And what I'm saying is our spiritual uh, legalities and our spiritual attitudes and our spiritual precept and they will lead us to shipwreck every time. Yet, every temptation to go wrong is also an opportunity to do right. Where's your heart? Where's your heart? 
When we see somebody else that's caught in a fault, don't look at their fault, look at their, what their heart is. Because I, I, I have some bad news for some of you that think that you're, you're so perfect, and that is simply this. You will fall. But here's the good news. God doesn't look at your falls. He looks at your heart. And I begin to look at that. See, that's, that's the reason why you read in the New Testament about temptation and testing, the same Greek word, parasimos. It's translated temptation and testing. A temptation becomes a test when instead of succumbing to the temptation, you say no, and you come out stronger. I don't need that. No. No. You're wrong. No. And in the haughtiness of some people's spirit, and in some cases, myself included, when I'm told no or when somebody comes against me, I get angry. How many of you know what I'm saying? I wish, and I'm going to throw somebody under the bus right now, I wish Gene would have sent the same little film clip that she sent to me to everybody in the church. And I wish the response that came from Donna when she seen that, when she sent it to me, were, were available to you. And matter of fact, I'm thinking about trying to get it up on the board so we can show it to you. It talks about trials and temptation. And when evil comes your way, how to deal with it. And it's this cat that has a real bad attitude. How many know what I'm saying? How many come against people with a real bad attitude? That's the cat. And there's this puppy that runs up and, and does it. And every time it would run up to the, the, the cat, the cat would slap it. And the little puppy would get excited, run around and chase its tail in all excitement. He wasn't bothered by the cat. He was excited about something that he had that the cat didn't. And that's joy. The joy of the Lord is my strength. And I just see, and the caption was that, that Gene said, I'm throwing, throwing you under the bus here. The caption was, I wish this was my reaction when I come against people that are angry and have bad attitudes. Pretty much a paraphrase. And... All of a sudden, I think you, you only sent it to Donna and I, right? All of a sudden, Donna responds, yeah, I want to see a video of you chasing your tail. But listen, that dog was chasing his tail. We need to be chasing or following the Holy Spirit who brings us joy. He's our joy. He's our peace. He's our long-suffering. He, I've got something that the cat, the world, doesn't have. And I need to be rejoicing over it. And I begin to look a little bit further. There's a reason why we need to encourage one another to stand firm. See, right from the beginning, Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple... You need to lift up your cross and follow me. Why must we recognize that there will be all kinds of suffering? Because there is. 
We, we talk about suffering, and we, we love to talk about baptism and salvation, right? We love to talk about water baptism. We love to talk about the baptism of the Holy Spirit. And most of us stop there. But there's a fourth baptism. And that is what? The baptism of suffering. What did Jesus say about that? You were baptized into his suffering. You will suffer a little bit. You will get a little bit put out. See, in Jesus, in some mysterious way, he learned obedience through the things that he suffered. That's what he said. I learned obedience through the thing that I suffered. How do we think that we can learn to be obedient without suffering? Oh, God, you're a beautiful God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. That is so superficial. But when we are in the battle lines, when we, we're red hot in the battle lines in the spiritual battle, you're going to have some suffering. You're going to get wounded. You're going to get beat up. You're going to get hungry. You're going to get tired. My brother-in-law opened up once before he passed away. He opened up once to me and he said this. He said, when I was in Vietnam, there were times that we would go three and four days without sleep. And we learned how to do it. We learned how to do it. Because we knew the enemy was right outside our gate. Listen to me. Sometimes it's going to require us to not do the normal thing, but move in the presence of God. And let me tell you something. If you think that you're getting away with anything, you're not. Indifference. Another word I've heard is laziness. If you are lazy, I'm going to give you a word right now, and it may seem hard to you, but it's true. If you are lazy, I don't care how much you claim to know Jesus, if you continue in your laziness, you're going to split hell wide open. And if you think that I'm kidding, look at the parable of the talents. I went out and hid. I, I hid it. I hid it. I hid it. Depart from me, you what? Wicked and slothful, lazy servant. We cannot be lazy in the kingdom of God. And if laziness has overtaken you, get out of it. Repent of it and, and start doing it. Because you have given up the very valuable prize that Jesus has given you. That may sound like a harsh word, but it's the truth. Donald Carlson in his book, How Long, O Lord, says, if even Jesus learned obedience by what he suffered, what ghastly misapprehension or arrogance is it that assumes that we should be exempt? We are not exempt. I don't like to do everything I do. How many of you like to do everything you do? How many of you get a little irritated at some of the things that you have to do? I call them watts. Some of you have heard me use that word watts. It, no, and it's not in the Dips, Webster's Dictionary, watts. A wad is a waste of time. I had supervisors when I worked that had to have meetings. And the reason why they had to have meetings is because they had to justify their job. And I know some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. 
And what took three hours could have been done in three minutes. And I began to look at that. We're not exempt. Why does God allow his people to suffer? Three things, and I'm going to go quickly here because I, I want to get to the incentives of standing firm. So I've got ten more points, and I'm going to do them within ten minutes. Why does God allow his people to suffer? One, because whom the Father loves, he chastens and disciplines. That's the reason why he allows you to suffer. Because sometimes it's for our discipline. Sometimes we need to go behind the woodshed. Two, it is only through stressful times that we discover how weak we are. God puts us in a wine press to squeeze the good out of us. You ever seen grapes in a wine press or apple in a, in a press making apple cider? And they just turn that and it presses and presses and stresses, stresses, and all of a sudden the juice just flows. But the juice becomes the beauty and the strength that goes on to nourish people. Thirdly, it's only when we discover our weakness that we discover what it means to be strong in him. In Christ, we learn to stand firm and we encourage each other to do it. We need to encourage each other to stand firm in the faith. What are the incentives of standing firm? I'm going to give them to you real quick. I'll do six of them. First, your incentive of standing firm is knowing that you're not alone. That helps. You are not on an island alone. There are people praying for you. I made it a point this week, especially in just going down, praying. First, for those who who I've had falling out with. I prayed for them. Then second, I prayed for acquaintances. And third, I prayed for each and every one of you in this church this week that God would show you that you're not alone. And I'm not talking about God walking with you, which he does. I'm not minimizing that at all. But I want you to know that we need one another and to pray for one another and to minister to one another, touch one another's hearts. The second thing is knowing that you're prayed for. That's helpful. Knowing that you're prayed for. I encourage you to, to do these things. Understand that you're not alone, that people are praying for you, and the second one is you're praying for other people. It's important. The third one is knowing that you stand, uh, that how you stand firm affects other people. If you collapse, they collapse. If you stand firm, they stand firm. I'm finding out, and I have these collapses every once in a while. I, I understand that, but I'm, I'm understanding, I'm also beginning to understand that I need to understand that I don't need to collapse, I need to trust Jesus. I don't need to take these things to heart. I don't need to be an emotional roller coaster. I need to stand firm because if I stand firm, people will see my faith and they'll stand firm with me. 
But if I, when I give up and I keep giving up and I keep giving up, why should I pray for them? They just give up. Boy, he's getting quiet in here, but it's truth. Don't collapse, because if you collapse, you might have other people that collapse. If you stand firm, they'll stand firm. Fourth, knowing that a genuine work of grace produces people who stand firm. You are saved by Grace. Saved by grace. I am saved by grace. It's grace that took Jesus to the cross that I might be free. His grace. A genuine work of grace produces people who stand firm. Five, knowing that one day you will be, or knowing that one day you will be out of it and you will be in his presence. I am looking forward to being in the presence of Jesus. I get tired sometimes of the wine press of life. Oh, God, take me out of it. I will say this to you. If you've ever said that in the last month or two, take me away. Relationship with Jesus is not Calgon. Relationship with Jesus is you're here for a purpose. And if you're not here, you're there. But since you're here, God has something yet for you to do. And lastly, knowing that God is working in your life in such ways and with such means that he might present you holy and blameless, that is what he's working towards within you. Let me tell you something. As much as Satan is working, God is working more. Wherever you're at, whatever you're doing, I want you to know His grace is sufficient for you. Paul said to the Colossian people, and I only did the second half of it in first or Colossians chapter 1, 22 and 23, it says this, in the body of his flesh through death, that Jesus died for you to present you holy and blameless and above reproach in his sight. See, even in your falls, even in my falls, Jesus still looks at you as blameless. He looks at you as holy, and he looks at you above reproach. Man may judge us, but God has already judged us, and he's judged us holy and blameless. Isn't that beautiful? If indeed you continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast, and are not moved away from the hope of the gospel which you have heard, which was preached to every creature under heaven, of which I, Paul, became a minister. Continue in the faith, grounded and steadfast. This week has been a difficult week for our state in the tornadoes and the storms and all the water we've had. I look around and even in Iowa City who didn't get the worst of it, I've seen trees that 
you go down Riverside Drive, you can see trees that have absolutely been uprooted by their roots and their foundation and turned over. Not all big trees, some of them smaller trees. But then I see some big trees. And those big trees are still standing firm. And I can only think I shall be like a tree by the waters. I shall stand. I shall stand. That the floods of life will not destroy me, will not uproot me, because I am rooted and grounded and based in Christ Jesus. Amen? That's what he wants. That's his desire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, let your word be rich in our life, touching us, encouraging us, let us understand, Lord, there's a correct way of understanding the battles that we go through. Give us discerning hearts that we would discern, Lord, the presence of the Holy Spirit. Give us attitudes of love to love one another, encourage one another, bind up one another. Lord, right now, in the name of Jesus, there are some here, including myself, Lord, who have had difficulties with others. And Father, I, for myself, have decided to pray and love them, whether they return it or not. Because you, that's what you told me to do to, so that I can stand firm. Give me a discerning heart to discern who you are. Give me, Father, a joy that passes understanding when the evil one comes at me. And Lord, when he swats at me, that I would go and get excited because I know that if the enemy is bothering me, I must be doing something right. And that I would spread joy. And Lord, that my heart would be moved and that I would walk in integrity of heart and stand firm in my relationship with you. And Father, I thank you, Lord, when I falter that it's your grace that causes me to stand firm when I can't. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Amen? How many of you know that God is good? I'll leave you with this statement. Irma Bombeck wrote a book, said, The grass is always greener over the septic tank. We may think the grass is greener by giving up and, and following the attitudes of the world. And it might be easier, but I'm going to tell you something. There's no greener pasture. There's no better place of feeding than at the feet of the master. Amen?
I don't want the septic tank stuff. I want the stuff that is from the presence of an ever-loving God. Father, we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I'm here to pray with you. I'm here to minister to you.